Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure for me being here. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about uh, automated reasoning and cognitive computing. I will explain the terms which are in this title in a second, hopefully. Uh, my talk is divided into three parts. Uh, I will talk a little bit about cognitive computing, what IBM understands under this term. I will talk about question answering. This is my main concern, my main research during the last years. And finally, I will talk in the last part about human or let's say common sense reasoning. Yeah? So, and of course, I'm talking about these topics from a certain perspective, namely from the perspective of automated reasoning. This is so, so the, the hammer and nail phenomenon. You know that? Whenever you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. And my hammer is an automated reasoning system, and so I'm looking around for nails wherever they are. Okay, automated reasoning. We have heard a lot about logics, in particularly in the previous talk, and about reasoning in previous talks. When I say automated reasoning, I mean something special. And I will talk a little bit about the history of automated reasoning. But when it started, I mean, there are earlier guys, but the, the, the most uh, interesting work started with Leibniz. Leibniz, one of the best known genius, genii in, in the age of enlightenment in, in Europe, he, he even constructed mechanical computers. I mean, there are some in the museum which are rebuilt. They were working computers he constructed in the, at that time. And he had a dream. And he, he formulated this dream in one of his writings in the following way. He said, well, in the future, uh, the philosophers and scientists would not argue. If they have different opinions, they, sit around, they will sit around the table and say, calculimus. And that's it. So his dream was that formal reasoning could substitute argumentation, so to say. And one of the other guys who was very much in favor of this dream was Hilbert, German mathematician. He, he gave a very famous talk in 1900 during uh, the World Exhibition in Paris, and he formulated this very famous 24 open problems at that time. And Hilbert was also dreaming about that. His dream was to mechanize, to formalize mathematics. And of course he had followers, Whitehead and Russell, they started writing uh, an oeuvre about how to formalize mathematics. This was a very, very uh, vivid area of research. But then the road became very, very bumpy because of a young, a young, <laughs> a young PhD student, Kurt Gödel. An Aust <laughs> Pun? Always this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, always. <laughs> and he, he wrote a, a PhD thesis, <laughs> and uh, the thesis said it is impossible, I mean very roughly, it is impossible to formulate something interesting, uh, an interesting part of mathematics. Yeah? It, it's impossible to do it in a complete way. And so this was, so to say, the end of this uh, automated reasoning dream of Leibniz and Hilbert. Also, Hilbert didn't believe it for a long time. Yeah? But uh, anyway, so then came people like Turing, and they started thinking about what does it mean to be computable. And then a new fresh area came into the area. What can we compute? What is possible? And so on and so forth. And then finally, a young French guy, uh, Jacques Herbron, he showed us a very, very important uh, tool how to do automated reasoning. So, and this is the time to say something about automated reasoning in contrast to reasoning. I mean, in logic, we have a problem when we try to automate it. You have seen a lot of examples, a lot of syllogisms. Let me try whether I can switch this system here. So now, how can I make it visible for you? No, the other way around. Here we go. Here we go. This is an example from a textbook. Uh, you see some logical formulae. Uh, you have to read it from right to left. Teaches L in computer science and in computer science R, then L is in R, right? So read it as an implication from right to left. Now read the second one. It's about a family situation. I'm pretty sure you understand it immediately, right? So now please read the, the third one. What does that mean? 
what, what, what is the meaning about this formula? No idea, right? I don't know either. And this is exactly the situation we are in symbolic logic. Yeah? The machine cannot understand these predicates here. It doesn't know anything about parental relations and things like that. The machine is in the same situation as you are when you read these names here, these predicate names. Yeah? And we have to deal with that. And uh, this is a difference between reasoning, in some cases I heard this, reasoning how humans do reasoning, they always attach semantics and pragmatics to the predicate. The machine is not able to do that. If we do automated reasoning, we have to build all this into the machinery. That's our problem. Now let's go back to the slides. Uh, okay, I showed you this. Okay, and Herbron uh, gave us a very important tool because he showed that, that in order to prove validity of a set of formulae or of a formula, it, you don't have to look into all interpretations which are available. Yeah? Because in logic, it's, if you want to prove validity of a formula, you have to prove that it is valid in every interpretation which is possible. And Herbron showed us that it is enough to consider a certain class of interpretation, namely these interpretations which are constructed out of the symbols within the formula. And this is what machines can do, right? They can construct interpretations made of symbols and not of meaning. So automated reasoning is all about symbol manipulation and not manipulation of meaning. That's important to understand, right? So what's on my next slide? Uh, yes, automated reasoning. I give you a small example. I mean, we have benchmarks in automated reasoning. Finally, we have benchmarks, thousands of problems, and everyone who is constructing a system is trying to solve such a system, such a benchmark problem. This is one of the very, very simple ones. So this is a story about someone who lives in Dreadbury Mansion, and this someone killed old Agatha. Agatha had a butler, and the butler hates everyone not richer than old Agatha, and so on and so forth. The usual puzzle, uh, riddle uh, stories which you can find in, in the newspapers. And the conclusion is uh, of this story, Agatha killed herself, and you have to prove that. Well, this is an easy problem. You read the story, you transform the story into logic, right? Then you get something like that. This is a part of the logic representation in a machine uh, readable format. For example, this uh, that Agatha is not the same as a butler. I mean, the machine doesn't know that. Of course, you imply it. Or this says, uh, this says, uh, for every x, uh, if Agatha hates the x, then the butler also hates the x. In this way, you formulate the story. And finally, you formulate the, the conjecture, killed Agatha herself, killed Agatha Agatha. And then you put all that into the machinery, which does not understand anything of the story, but it understands how to manipulate this logic to formally. And finally, you get a proof. Very easy, right? So this is the way we, 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 we work on that. But now, <coughs> Uh, this was a very simple problem. Let's a little bit more about history. 75 problems for testing provers. This was our Bible in the 1980s. These 75 problems, the one you've seen is one of them, uh, we tried to prove. This was, this was a challenge. To give you an impression about that, this is problem number 63. You see, these are two equations. This is a logical representation. Two equations and here three axioms, and you have to prove this. Yeah? Out of the three, a very simple textbook mathematics. These were the really difficult problems at that time. Nowadays, we are challenged by problems which include knowledge bases. For example, research psych is one of these knowledge bases. This knowledge base consists out of half a million of concepts which form uh, knowledge about the domain of common sense, right? We have more than five million assertions, facts and rules in this knowledge base, uh, more than 26,000 relations. Uh, and we have to deal with this 
huge set of formulae. And even this is research, psych is a commercial product. They sell these knowledge bases, these ontologies. Uh, this is a version, a smaller version for, for research. And this is an open psych which is available via the internet. And even this smallest open psych contains more than three million predicate logic formulas. Can you imagine? These are the, the these are the the, 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 the mere size is incredible to deal with that. Okay, even more impressive is the progress in, in, in SAT solving, in propositional logic. So this is the formula in propositional logic. You, all, you don't have quantors, you just have propositional variables, negation, uh, conjunction, disjunction, and the problem, the sub problem is, does there exist an assignment satisfying all of these clauses, a clause is uh, such a sequence of disjunctions, right? I mean, very simple task. Yeah? Uh, this is a f well known to be an NP uh, complete problem, though the, the, the PNP problem is uh, connected very basically with that, uh, with that problem. Anyway, uh, in the early 90s, we were able to handle problems with 100 variables and 200 constraints, so closest. Nowadays, the, the SAT solvers are able to, to do more than a million variables and more than 20 million clauses. And this is a progress made in less than 20 years. It's incredible what's going on there. It is very much connected to search, to heuristic search. Huh? Anyway. Uh, now, this was a short, very short impression about automated reasoning. Let's come to the term cognitive computing. Cognitive, we have cognitive science. I don't have to talk about cognitive science with this audience. You all know what's that. Yeah, maybe you have heard about cognitive robotic. Ever heard this term? Cognitive robotic. You may think of robots which have cognitive abilities and research about uh, how to, to, to construct cognitive systems which are robotics. In this is not always true, unfortunately. If you look to a proceeding paper about cognitive robotics, you will notice that's pure logic. It's action logic. That's it. There's nothing about cognitive science in cognitive robotics. What's about cognitive computing? So if we Google that, of course we Google that all. <laughs> The, at least at the time, at the time when I did the slides, the first hit was an IBM research hit yeah? and uh, about cognitive computing, and that's interesting. IBM coined this term cognitive computing. Uh, the marketing department of IBM says cognitive computing is artificial intelligence meets business intelligence. A very good term, yeah, <laughs> cognitive computing. Uh, they say in more detail, cognitive computing systems are systems that learn and interact naturally with people to extend what either man or machine could do on their own. They help human experts make better decisions by penetrating the complexity of big data. And so, of course, big data has to be in a definition which is modern. Anyway, humans and machines should work together. They should interact and should be better than each of them. In there. So this is uh, the definition of, uh, like IBM is giving it, where does it come from? It comes from uh, the Watson system. You, you have heard about Watson and Jeopardy? Yes, fine. So, uh, and I mean, this was an incredible success. And IBM had an incredible success like that in 1960, I think it was, when they, when they won uh, with, the, with the machine against the world champion in chess. Yeah? This was incredible at that time. Uh, but then IBM uh, deconstructed the computer after this success and it was never reconstructed again, eh? never. Uh, this is very different with Watson. IBM is turning Watson now into a business model and they have a lot of, of applications for Watson. For example, they started with customer engagement. Watson, Watson is supporting this. Watson is supporting healthcare. Watson is defeating cancer, that's the marketing department. Uh, Watson is doing research in finance. It's supporting humans. Yeah? And, this is a, and even Watson is a chef. Uh, it invents uh, recipes. I, I cooked one of them, incredible gazpacho with ginger. I can recommend that. It was invented. <laughs> it was in, invented by Watson. Yeah? So that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, okay. So cognitive computing. Uh, to sum it up, 
these are the ingredients. We have multiple knowledge formats. We have textbook knowledge, we have formal knowledge, we have pictures. And of course, if we have multiple formats, we have multiple reasoning mechanisms yeah, which have to deal with this format. And all these modules have to cooperate. And which is very important, it's time critical. If you want to communicate, if you want to cooperate with a human, you can't let him wait for 10 minutes. I mean, humans are impatient. You know that if you're sitting in front of your computer. They are time critical. And of course, we have to interact with humans. This is why we should understand how humans are working. Yeah? This is the last part of my, of my talk then. Okay, so cognitive computing as defined by IBM. Now, uh, I was working for years on, on, on a project on natural language query answering which can, which can be considered to be a poor man's Watson system. I mean, I was funded by the National Science Foundation and not by IBM, so there was not so much money in there. Anyway, uh, I, I, I tried to explain a little bit what we were doing in this, have been doing in this uh, project, because then you will understand how reasoning and search and knowledge will interact, hopefully. Okay, so this is our corpus. This is our corpus. This is a German version uh, of the Wikipedia. So we take the entire Wikipedia, we download it into our into a file, and then we have uh, approximately 30 millions of sentences in natural language. So this is the corpus we want to work on. We want to uh, answer questions on the base of this corpus, right? Oh, very easy to define, hard to do. Okay, so this is again, this is a small portion of this corpus. And now we were, had been working together with computer linguists, which were working for more than 20 years on this problem. How can we define the semantics of a sentence in natural language? Or in other words, how can we transform a sentence in natural language into a logical formula which represents the sem semantics, right? And they had a lot of tools for that. They have a lot of tools, but I don't uh, work together with them anymore because they are, have the tools only for German. This is why my example in this part of the talk uh, German. So anyway, they transformed the entire 30 million sentences into logic. This is a work of four to five days, one work week. A few students were involved to disambiguate things, but most of the thing was done automatically. So that means they take each sentence, they transform it into logic. This is a graphical notation like a semantic network. You can imagine that such thing can be transformed very easily into a logical representation, right? So, and they do that sentence for sentence, paragraph for paragraph, until we have a huge set of logical formulae. And these logical formulae we put into a database, right? So now we have two sources. We have the natural language text and we have the database of logical formulae defining the semantics of the text. And so my first idea is now we are done. We put all this together with a query into a serial prover and the serial prover of course gives us the answer. I mean, this is silly. I mean, you can put this set of formula into a, into a machine and expect that the machine can load it or can translate it. I mean, in order to load it into a machine, you have to do a lot of pre-processing steps. You have to do indexing and you have to count symbols and all this. This is impossible to do this with this amount. So we have to follow plan B. <clears throat> And this is now uh, that we, we use these different knowledge formats. In the first step, we, though we have a question. Rudy Giuliano was the Lord Mayor of which U.S. city? Yeah, this is a bit older now. Huh? Uh, of which U.S. city? Now we have this knowledge base, and now we do a traditional syntax-based search, like Google is doing it, like uh, every search machine is doing it. We go with this query, with this keywords, Lord Mayor, uh, U.S. city name into the, the, this natural, la natural text without doing any logic and trying to fit to find the best hits. This is a ranking which Google gives you whenever you query it. So then we take the best 200 hits. This is not trivial, but I will not focus on that. You know that ranking in, is very tricky. What is a good hit? What is a not so good hit? So we're trying to to find the best 200 text pieces. And now logic comes into the game. 
For every one of these text pieces, we have here three of them, we take one of the text pieces, we go to the uh, logical database and take the logical formula, which is the semantics of this text, out of the database. And then, of course, we translate also the, the, uh, the query into logic. And now this is a bit more, more uh, doable. It seems a, lit a little bit more doable. We have a query in logic. We have a piece of semantics in logic. And we put that together into our machinery, which hopefully gives us a proof, right? Well, this is not the whole story. We need, of course, some background knowledge. I will come to that point later. But this is uh, the, the, the rough uh, strategy. Yeah? But of course, we do that not only for one piece. We do it for any one of these 200 pieces. And so we get a lot of proofs out of that. Yeah? A lot of proofs. Well, these are not really proofs, but I call it proofs for the moment. And then we take the five best of these proofs. And out of the five best, we try to construct an answer. Uh, okay, so I said these are not really proofs. What do I mean by that? Let's have a look uh, to this uh, query though. This is a query translated in logic. We have it here again. We don't have to go into the details, but I just want to show you that we have a sequence of sub queries which we have to solve with the help of this logic here and with the help of some background knowledge. And you see, for example, that here we have the term US city. But it may occur that in this, uh, in this piece of knowledge, there is no US, the term US city is not mentioned. Moreover, it's uh, written New York. Then, of course, we don't know that New York is a US city, at least not in this, in this, folk, in this context. This is why we couldn't prove that. So we skipped this sub goal. Another sub goal we had to skip is Rudy, because in the piece of knowledge, the, the, the entire name was mentioned Rudolf Giuliani and not Rudy. So we don't know that Rudy is a short form of Rudolf. Yeah? So we had to, we are not able to prove that. We had to skip it. Skip it and so on and so forth. You see, we, we were only able to prove things by throwing away parts that we cannot prove. Uh, this is why I said we don't really have proof, but we can compare these partial proofs. We will come to this point also later on. Okay, so, and of course, I didn't tell you the, the entire story. We need a lot of machine learning in order to find the best proof. We need a lot of background knowledge. I come to this point later on again. And only with these things, it is possible to find the proof. So let me come a little, uh, let's discuss a little bit more in detail this partial proof thing. How does it come? I showed you this example before. So we had this text of the story, we transformed this text of the story into logic by hand, and then we put it into a theorem prover, and you see uh, the prover gives us a result in less than a second. This is a very simple problem, it's no, nearly no time required to prove it. What did we do? Let's have a look to it from a software engineering's point of view. So we had a natural language problem. Eh? This is the cloud here. Then I gave it to a human. This human was thinking about the content. It was translating the story into a logical formula S, S set of formulae. Eh? And then we are throwing this set of formulae into a prover, and the prover says yes. Okay. So, but of course, in uh, doing automated reasoning, we always want to get rid of the human <laughs> in the workflow, at least. <laughs> uh, so, how can we get rid of the human? Uh, uh, so, of course, we go to a machinery. <laughs> we go to a machinery which is trying to understand this sentence. Uh, and this machinery gives us a set of formulae, and then we put in this set of formulae. But, uh, as a machinery, we use the Boxer system by Johan Boos from the Netherlands. It's a very, very nice system which accepts English language sentences and it gives you a logical representation of the semantics like I used it before in this project I was depicting. So, we are, so this is the machinery which gives us the sentence. So we put in the, the story about Agatha, we put in the story and we get this out as a formula. 
right? I mean, it's not well structured, this is one thing, but uh, I don't care for structure. This is a machine who should read it. But the point is, within this formula, there is a lot of linguistic knowledge. There is a lot of knowledge about the structure of the sentences. For example, we have here, uh, we have here, uh, uh, live, the predicate live, but also there is a, a indication that this is a verb or we have a noun here, uh, people is a noun, or we have a name, Redbury, and so on and so forth. I mean, what I want to say is, it's not only the structure of the riddle, uh, which is in the logical formula, it's also about linguistic. Yeah? And of course, our prover is not able to distinguish these things. He's trying to prove. And he's trying to prove this, and you wait and wait. I stopped it after 30 seconds. And uh, the most important is this part here, no proof found. Yeah? So this is what I mean. We, never, we nearly never find proofs. We find partial proof. We have proof attempts. Yeah, proof attempts. OK, oh, this is, no, let, we did a little experimentation to understand better what this is a partial proof, what this is a, a proof attempt. For this, we did a simpler problem, not a linguistic problem, but we just uh, did an experiment with propositional logic. So let's do this experiment. So this is, a, again, a set of formula. So this is, the, the lines are con, uh, connected by a conjunction. That means P0 is true and this implication, if P, P4 is true, then P2 or P3 or P7 is true. Huh? Clear, easy to read. Okay, P0 implies P4 and so on and so forth. Uh, this means P2 implies false. In other words, this means not P2. P2 is not true. Okay, you understand this, right? So now I'm asking you, without having any machinery, I'm asking you about logical consequences. What's about, or what is closer to a logical consequence? I always present you two variables, two uh, propositions, P0 or P2. What is closer to be a logical consequence? What do you think? P0 or P2? What follows uh, out of this set of clauses? Any idea? Where are the logicians? <laughs> no logicians in here? <laughs> I mean, look here. Here in the first line it says P0 is true. So certainly P0 is a logical consequence. Uh, P2 is in here. This thing, P2 might be true if P4 is true, but we don't know that, right? Even that, it's false. So it is not, the, I mean, P0, of course, right? P0 is closer to be, but uh, this could. This is what you call a partial proof instead of. No, this is what I call a guess at the moment. I just, because this is why I'm asking you, and not my machine. My machine can do it, but yeah. can you do it? Yeah? I'm asking you. Okay, let's go on. What is closer to be a logic consequence, P5 or P6? Any idea? Yeah? I don't get the question. Pardon? I don't understand the question. Okay, what is a logical consequence? Given that this is true, yeah? yeah. You understand this formally. Yeah, yeah. Given this is true, yeah. is then P0 true or P2 true? P0 is certainly true. Sure. This is why it's closer to be a logical consequence to P2 compared to P2. This is, a very, this is a very fuzzy notion I, I'm introducing now, right? right? It's, I just want to appeal to your intuition. Uh, what about this year, P5 or P6? Look, P6 is true if P3 and P5 is true. So if P5 is true, then P6 is true. That means P5 could be a bit closer to be a logical consequence, right? No, there's only one way, namely, uh, uh, okay, yes, yes. sure, okay, so anyway, uh, it's uh, informal, so yes, it's P5, now the next one, P1 or P6, P6 is true if these two are true, P1 is true if these three are true, which is closer, what, P6, yes, because if these two are 
2, P6 is 2. For P1, you have to have P, 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 P8 also. Yeah? So, it's, so, okay, so. This is one point of view. What I wanted to do is just doing an experiment. And now, after I, I've done this experiment, I try to use a machine learning technique. I, I try to use a, a, a machine learner in order to do this. So we turn this into a classification problem, right? The classification problem is that we have a, a relation larger, smaller, or equal. And now we do machine learning. We have a classification problem. The instances are always a pair of variables, as you did it right now. Uh, and we have a lot of attributes in the training phase of the learner. We have, of course, the formula, as you had it. And we also have in the learning phase an, a proof by a machine, right? And we can give the, 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 the machine learning system a lot of inf information about the proof, about the, uh, about the proportion of clauses where P is in the head or where Q is in the head and so on, and some rudimentary dependencies. But well, well, this is what we give to the machine learning system during the training phase. Yeah? So for training, we generated a thousand sets of clauses. You just saw one set of clauses. We generated randomly thousands of this. Each, clause, uh, each uh, set of clauses contained 10 subclauses, 10 lines, and each one had 12 variables. So immediate large uh, problems uh, for the training set. So then we train the system. Yeah? These are the machine learning systems out of the box. You can use, you give them the training examples, and it hopefully will learn a classifier. Yeah? And now comes the, the testing phase. Yeah? The test set, again, we generated randomly uh, sets of clauses, and we had 12,000 instances. Yeah? So, and now for the, for the test sets, we don't have a proof. I just uh, do the same as I did with you. I show you the two variables and I ask the system, yeah? what is closer to be on a logical consequence? And as a learning method, we use decision, decision trees and the results were really astonishing. Our system, the learning system was uh, able to correctly classify 98% of the examples. And this is interesting. You see that this is a confusion matrix. If the problem was less than, in more than 5,000 cases, uh, the system said it is less than. And these are the errors here. Yeah? But the diagonal is, uh, are the correct classified problems. And that's interesting. So our system didn't do any inferences after it learned. It, it learned what it is a logical consequence, and then it was able to do this correct stuff. Yeah? Quite interesting. So we are continuing this work with predicate calculus also, not only with propositional calculus. So you see, this is what I mean with uh, what is a closer to be a proof or not. Yeah? We have to deal with that in these real life applications of logic. Okay, now the last part, humans and reasoning. I'm, I'm I skip the next slides because this is uh, what you know. I skip that. I skip that. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, these are books I recommend for computer scientists. This is a book by, by Kies and Michael Langwalden. Very nice, very nice to read. This is by a, a logician, Bob Kowalski. And this one, you know, we have heard this already, right? I mean, this is a, a reading list for computer scientists, not for psychologists. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my next slide was about, so what I want to show you now is uh, our attempt, our hammer, how, to, how we use our hammer for, for some tasks which are associated with human reasoning. Yeah? Uh, there's a Basin selection task. You have heard about that several times before. I don't want to repeat that. This is the abstract Basin sele selection task. This is uh, the context Basin selection task. The, the point I want to stress is, we have heard about that, that p humans are better if there is a context. This is only half of the story. There are different kinds of contexts. There is a study which shows that uh, there are social contract rules, like the one with the beer and the age, and there are also precaution context rules. For example, if you uh, drive your car, you should fasten your seatbelt. 
And these two context rules are obviously treated different in a different way by humans. There is one paper I remember by Stone et al. Uh, she had a patient uh, with a lesion in, in the amygdala and this patient was able to do the, the social contract rules but not the precautions rules or the vice versa, I don't remember. Uh, and the one he was not able to do, he did it with the same performance and the abstract case. So this seems that there are special norms, social precaution, maybe others, which are triggered by the task. And we were trying to model this by deontic logic. I was a bit astonished when I re read your book, Keith, that there was, is a large part about deontic logic, but then you decide to use this abduction-based uh, logic problem. We had to discuss this later on, maybe. Uh, so we've, we were focusing on deontic logic, partly because our hammer was able to do deontic logic, <laughs> of course. Uh, because the, so, I don't go into details, don't be afraid, <laughs> but uh, just to show you how the deontic comes into the game. This is a very simple version of the card game. We have only one card, the letter side of the card is an A, or the letter side is a K, letter side is a K and so on. So this says uh, there is, uh, the number side is a four, uh, there can be only one number on one side. Uh, the number side four and the number side seven is impossible. So I mean, this is a formalization of uh, of a very simple basic card. And now comes the deontic logic into the uh, uh, game. I formulate the, the the question of the task as a norm. If the letter side of a card is an A, then it should be the case that the number side is a four. This this model operator. This is the ontic operator it has to be read, it ought to be or it should be, yeah, right? And this is nothing else than model logic K with the seriality axioms. I don't go into these details now, but uh, uh, model logic K is uh, very easy. It's a decidable uh, logic. Uh, it's very easy to, to, to process. So, and our approach using the ontic logic allows to f formulate uh, different different contexts. This, for example, is one context. If you are under 21, it should be the case that you not drink beer. If you drink beer, then it should be the case that you're not under 21. So you can formulate these norms with deontic logic. And the, the, the interesting thing is, in model logic, you can have multi-model logic. You can have an, an deontic operator, you can have different deontic operators. And my t hypothesis is that we uh, can model this with different deontic operators. This one is for the social context, and this is a different one for the precocious uh, context. And so we can, we, we can uh, model this use of different uh, contexts in humans, maybe. I don't go into details of that. We also dealt with, uh, we also dealt with uh, a suppression task with root binds, suppression task. But I don't go into details. All this is written down. If you're interested, I can, or I give you uh, some references uh, before in the written version. You can go into that. Anyway, so we are trying to use the ontic model logic to model these aspects of human reasoning. Okay, now let me finally come to another area which is in AI called common sense reasoning. And I understand that this is the AI view of human <coughs> reasoning. I mean, if psychologists say human reasoning, say, yeah, you know what they understand. We have heard this before in many times. Ta uh, ta Yes, <laughs> okay. Uh, AI people are trying to use symbolic logic, but they are trying to model this common sense reasoning, non-monotonic reasoning, for example. Yeah? So, uh, there is this famous treaty example. Uh, this is everywhere in the AI literature. Um, all birds can fly. Uh, treaty is a bird, so you conclude by modus ponens that uh, Tweety can fly, but what if Tweety is a penguin? Yeah? And these are the examples they're using. There is a Yale shooting problem, also a very nice small little problem. And all the literature uh, in common sense reasoning is using these examples. Yeah? But this is not the way we want to 
do examples in automated reasoning. We, we need benchmarks. We need benchmarks in order to show in which parts our system is better than another system, which are the interesting parts, and benchmark problems have to be, uh, we, we need large sets of these benchmarks problems in order to, to do uh, really empirical uh, evaluations. And there is some hope recently uh, Levesque, Hector Levesque, one of the leading persons in uh, non-monotonic reasoning, came with a benchmark uh, set, named, he called it the Vinograd Schemas Challenge. It is uh, given natural language. Uh, there is a statement describing a, a situation. The trophy wouldn't fit into the brown suitcase because it was too big. And there are two, and there's a question what was too big and there are two answers and you have to find out which answer is more plausible. The trophy was too big or the suitcase was too big. You see, this is no problem for you because you, you understand the predicates, you understand the, 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 um, the individuals which are mentioned here, you know what a trophy, what a suitcase is, and you know the relations, big, uh, big suitcase, big trophy, and so on and so forth. But the machine does not know that. How can we do that? Huh? How can we find out what is more plausible? Or the other uh, set of benchmarks we are focusing on is the choice of plausible alternative, very similar. Premise is the man broke his toe. What were the cause of this? Two alternatives, he got a hole in his sock or he dropped the hammer on his foot. Of course you know immediately what is more plausible. I mean this is really problem, uh, the problem is uh, you have to handle natural language if you want to do this automatically. And, okay, well, I skipped it. So these are the, there is a third part of benchmark I will present to you because it's really based on a nice uh, psychological psychological experiment. It's a triangle copper challenge. Uh, it based on an experiment Heider and Simmel did in the, in the 1940s. Uh, it was the beginning of attribution theory. Uh, and this is really famous. The people, uh, the problems were sitting in front of this movie and they were telling uh, what they see. And they saw drama. They saw love dramas. They saw uh, fights. They saw everything. Yeah? Uh, so they saw whatever they wanted to see, right? And uh, uh, Maslan and his co-workers are ta taking these examples uh, for benchmarks and they're doing it uh, like that. They describe a situation, a small triangle and a big triangle are next to each other. A circle runs by and pushes the small triangle. The big triangle chases the circle. And then they go and they formulate this in logic, like I did it with my very first example, you remember with Stone and Agatha, they do it by hand. So that means you don't have to process the natural language, you get the description of this uh, problem in logic. Right? And then you have a question, how does the little triangle feel? Two alternatives, the little triangle feels relieved. This is the question, the, the alternative in logic. The little triangle is angry at the big triangle. This is in logic. So you can try to process now this uh, benchmark problem without doing the natural language stuff. Yeah? But even this is difficult. <coughs> I skip that. Uh, I skip that. Let me. Even this is difficult because. You have the problem, it's given already in, in, in logic. But you also need some background knowledge which tells you about what is push, what is chase, uh, what is relief, right? And how are these predicates related to each other? Each other? And this is a background knowledge. For example, uh, pushing something is attacking something. I mean, this is a relation you know if you read it, but we have to add this background knowledge. Uh, and so on and so forth. And then we have some normative statements. Again, you remember we are doing deontic logic. We, 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 we add some normative statements saying that uh, if you are defended by someone, you should be released or something like that. Yeah? Uh, these are normative statements. We put this together with the query and then we can try to prove that with our uh, proof. This sounds very simple because these are small sets of formula, but the problem is the, bench, uh, the background knowledge. I will come to this uh, with the next slide, set of slides. Okay, now, uh, 
the, this was triangle copper where we had the logic at hand already. Let's try to do the copper uh, where we have to process the natural language, right? Then we see a little bit of the problems again. So again, we use our boxer system. I mentioned that before. Uh, we take uh, the story, the situation, and the alternative, and we translate it with our boxer system, or with Johann's boxer system, into logic. Yeah? And this is a small uh, formula which describes exactly uh, the situation and these two uh, alternatives. Yeah? Uh, the alternatives was the gra no, I, uh, my body. The, the situation is that my body casts a shadow o over the grass, right? So. So we have a formula representing all that. Uh, we throw it uh, into the, uh, this, I said this already, but how can we process it? So we have a first order representation of the, uh, of the copper benchmark here. And we have background knowledge. I, I, I noticed, uh, I mentioned that before, that we have this knowledge base like open psych, which is freely available, millions of sentences describing this interesting things in the world that uh, pushing is an attack and so on and males are uh, humans and humans are mammals and things like that right this is all given in the background knowledge and of course we want to use this background knowledge to process this set of formula but there is unfortunately an obstacle in between why the problem is look here we have in this uh, first order representation, we have a predicate cast. The V stands for verb cast. Yeah? My body cast a shadow. In the background knowledge, we have a, a, a predicate named project, to project something, right? And how do we know that this cast has anything to do with project. Yeah? These are different predicate names. From a symbolic point of view, we can have no clue that these fit together. So, but there is hope, namely WordNet. WordNet is freely available via the net. You can uh, query it. If you go to WordNet, uh, then you see, for example, that if you search for cast, you see it's a noun and it's a verb. And there we have synonyms for this verb. And the synonym is project, cast, code, drive, throw. And from this word net, we can easily, or we can try to extract these connections between cast and uh, project. So, and this, is, this connection is done by a bridging formula. So again, so we go to word net, find synonyms or other uh, relation, uh, related uh, verbs. And we, we, we formulate a, a formula out of that with that's the bridging, right? And now we are, we are lucky because now we can, we, we can uh, formulate the first order representation together with this bridging formula. This might be many of them, right? Which does the alignments of the predicate names. And we have the background knowledge. And now we are nearly ready to start, but Another obstacle, life is hard. <laughs> Another obstacle. Namely, the obstacle is the size of the knowledge base. I cannot load the knowledge base into my system and they process. Yeah? Again, no chance. This was also in the first part where I mentioned our project. But, of course, there is research on selecting this. I mean, I talked to some colleagues here from... from from cognitive science, and when I told them the problem, said, well, that's a frame problem. Yes, it's a frame problem, but naming a problem doesn't solve it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, ha I have to solve it. I have to handle it. Yeah? It is a frame problem. Which frame of this huge part of the background knowledge is appropriate for solving my problem? Yeah? And there is a lot of research going on since a few years. Uh, these are clustering approaches. We are trying to cluster this huge set of knowledge into similar into similar pieces forming a cluster and then we are trying to use these clusters which fit I don't go into details but there is a, a, a bunch of works doing that so that means we are using this work to select the appropriate parts of the background knowledge and then we put it in the this was too fast sorry no so. And then we, we, we put all that into, into our prover, and then we are trying to solve the benchmarks. 
So, what I try to convince you now to conclude is that when, in automated when people in automated reasoning try to solve real world problems, they have to deal with knowledge, with a lot of knowledge. Not the inferences are the problem. I did a lot of work in defining calculi for first order predicate logic. That's easy. I mean, it's fun. This is interest for, for a logician to, to de design a correct and complete system of inferences. But if you want to apply this system of inferences, you need knowledge. And knowledge is large, and you have to deal with that. And the problem is to find the right chunks of the, uh, of the knowledge. And in other words, when we do automated reasoning, our problem are not the inferences. Our problem are not the reasoning steps, like you saw this in the syllogisms. This is what we have in, uh, we, we can handle. Our problem is picking the right uh, pieces of knowledge picking the right formula in order to find the proof. This is the main problem in, in uh, automated reasoning, finding the appropriate parts of the formula or of the set of formula in order to uh, prove interesting things. And uh, we started, uh, just to conclude um, a little bit of marketing, marketing, we started a workshop series this year. It's the second one uh, during the main AI conference in New York in two weeks. And this workshop series is trying to connect uh, things between human reasoning and automated reasoning. And I'm very happy that Keith was always uh, willing to help with this workshop because he and Michael did a lot of work in connecting these things. Thank you very much.